So first of all, welcome to this panel, and indeed welcome to our disruptors here. Hopefully they all feel like old friends after these few days in the mountain, but really delighted to have Laura, Michael, Bailey and she with us. And they'll, they'll introduce their work in just a minute. We'll have a rapid fire round. Um, we'll hear the vision of Cradle to Cradle, how we really switch to timber, but also the potential of broader biobased materials and equitable and generative value chains that are just as good for the workers as for the planet for hearing how, thanks, uh, I'm loud enough already, I'm often told, so. <laughs> and, and hearing visionary investors of how we really move this regenerative piece on. But just to set the scene a little, you heard that statistic from Leslie, 2020 was the year that the total mass of human-made material outweighed all biomass on the planet. Now, I'm quite an optimistic guy. I read into that, at the start of the 20th century, we were at 3%. So as we know, because it was called the Industrial Revolution, we've been through a resource revolution pretty recently, and I'm a great believer we can do it again, but just with really fundamentally different goals steering us. We know these figures, our sector's about a third of all resource use, materials driving about 11% of, of, of carbon dioxide emissions, and in these talk this morning was a real reminder to get very real about this. In the global north, if we're talking circular economy, We've got to start actually putting that principle of, well, don't build and question the need where you can, and really harvest our existing materials and assets wherever possible. We've got to really question where we're placing our carbon budget. And really, a fantastic regenerative shiny offices is, is where we place that carbon budget. Because we know, again, we're doubling floor space by 2016 in the global south. That drive towards affordable housing for all is absolutely critical. So these new regenerative materials, value chains, Circularity is going to be critically important. To hand over to our next speaker, I was in Stuttgart last, last week, and I was invited to eat a cradle-to-cradle -cradle certified carpet. We talked about being able to really eat our buildings. I declined, declined <laughs> kind of offer to our host, but having heard not so long ago the off-gassing from the wrong sorts of carpets can actually be akin for a newborn crawling around them to passive smoking. This isn't just about planetary health, it's really about human health. And so without further ado, Nora, over to you to hear more about the to Craig. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for your invitation as well. I think we started it. Um, so I have a few minutes to just uh, briefly uh, tell you a bit about our work and uh, why we think Craig to Craig is so important. Um, so I was showing up uh, yesterday that um, for us, it's uh, we need to look at how we build, how we are processing, and how we are producing um, in a holistic way. I mean, we were talking about this uh, for two days now, so I'm I think I'm in with you. Um, but uh, I think to combine all of this, um, this is something that we really do by talking about cradle to cradle. So actually, it's not only about thinking circular, it's not only about a circular economy or about using some um, materials again. Uh, we saw this uh, in the presentations yesterday as well. So it's a, it, we think it's about um, a way of thinking that we actually use materials that are healthy for using them, because if you're only using um, materials again and again, and you're cycling them, then you can have a linear economy in cycles, and then you call it circular economy, but at the end, we will have a lot of toxic materials that will stay in these cycles, and at the end, there will always be some phase out we need if we are only focusing on cycling. So focusing on using the right material for the circular economy, and then of course, like we already heard yesterday as well, not focusing on just uh, doing this always and again, but actually fo focusing on positive impact we need. Because if we, are, if we are here already, if we are talking only about how can we uh, be less bad, how can we get to the point to have um, a less, less climate crisis, we still have climate crisis, and if we are, talking about only being less bad, we are too many. So actually thinking about how can we build a building or how can we create products in a way 
that are actually beneficial. And that means not only having a house that is not off-gassing or a carpet that is not off-gassing, but how can we have a building that cleans the air, a building that cleans the water, a building that is beneficial for the people who are in there, a building that is uh, helping biodiversity to flourish, a building that is actually um, yeah, being uh, a material bank and is not uh, actually yeah, uh, uh, taking these resources into waste, but actually only using the materials. So we can talk about like a lot of things that go along with it. Um, I mean, the most of you probably know uh, that we, by talking about cradle to cradle, should think in, in circles, and we are um, talking about the biosphere and the technosphere here. So actually looking on what kind of scenario your product is actually um, used for, and if we are using products that go into the biosphere, they have to be biodegradable and they have to go there. And you can uh, put this into any discussion. Um, if you're using a product only and you're not actually uh, putting it into the biosphere, then of course it can be a, a product that is made for using it again. But then we need the uh, right business models to go behind it. And this is something that is like, uh, also missing in, in a lot of discussions when we are only talking about circularity but not how we actually get these materials back and that we don't have to own all these materials. Um, yeah, just to really shorten up what we do, we are accelerating the uh, movement um, and the way, the pathway to cradle to cradle um, for 10 years now. We are an organization with 40 people working in um, Berlin and we have uh, 1,000 volunteers who are bringing these idea into society because we say it's not only about the products, it's not only about the science, but we need a shift in mindsets and so we need people to really get to know about these ideas and that <coughs> cradle to cradle becomes the new normal and we don't have to call it cradle to cradle, we can uh, call it whatever we want, but we need to really think um, differently and to get there we are doing a lot of educational work we work with schools we work with all um, yeah kind of people to actually get this mindset in we have networks to bring municipalities together to help them to get this way um, and one big um, part of our work is to do this laboratory project where we really show that you can already implement a lot of these things I was talking about, but not uh, only implementing them, we've heard about a lot of projects, but combining it with a big campaign that actually shows that this is possible and um, yeah, it helps people to just uh, go along and do the same things, maybe in a better way, and show that this is, um, yeah, this. And I, we were talking about um, like our project uh, laboratory temple of a place where we show that we can make concerts in a phase of like, uh, we were talking about 250,000 people coming together for four days um, and um, showing that you can do this in a cradle to cradle way. It's not only about a product, it's about like actually changing how we are uh, yeah, doing everything we do and showing this, but then also helping people to just like, really do this as well. Um, and we also <coughs> did a, a, a project where we showed that you can do this, for example, in a, a Eastern Berlin Plattenbau, a, a place, uh, a, a building from Eastern German time, where you can show it's also about how you're actually renovating your buildings, I mean 70% of the buildings that will be there in 2050 are already here now. And so of course we cannot only talk about new buildings, but how are we gonna work with these old buildings? And so we have made up this project as well and show that this is possible. People can come there and see that uh, yeah, it's already possible. They can learn how this works um, there as well. And just to sum it up, we are looking for our next um, big project to do this as well. So um, we have a lot of ideas. 
talking about how you could make a hospital in a cradle to cradle way, how you could make a supermarket in a cradle to cradle, and, and there's a lot of things go together like building, but also packaging, um, uh, mobility, energy. So bring these concepts together and showing people that uh, it it is something that uh, belongs to everyone around. Thank you. Passing the baton, as the image shows, <laughs> and Michael, you're up next on growing the future. Great. Thank you, Nora. Thank you, Jane. So, yes, I work on growing the future and moving from a uh, historic uh, and heroic past of extracting our materials to a future where we cultivate and work with nature to grow our building materials. And at the Center for Natural Material Innovation, we work across scales from the cell walls all the way up to skyscrapers. And I think this is important and part of the conversations we've been having here, uh, I want to say all week, but it's only been a couple of days, um, that this is a systemic approach. Um, and in terms of buildings, we look at forestry all the way to the finished thing. Um, and ultimately, our aim is to replace buildings on the right um, with the center and building on the left, which are the two tallest timber skyscrapers in the world at the moment at 85 and 87 meters respectively. And this is, this is valuable because in 1885, it's exactly the same height as the home insurance building in Chicago, the world's first steel frame skyscraper. <coughs> and in less than 50 years, we went to 381 meters of the Empire State Building. Not every timber building needs to be that tall, uh, but the properties of building with timber, strength for weight and stiffness for weight are as good or better than structural steel. And we need to remember that and value the properties that nature gives us. And when we build with timber, we can build with entirely new ways, using factories, using greater gender equity in stable jobs rather than construction site jobs. Um, but we're not going to do this unless we have proper stewardship for our trees, and understand that we cut down the right trees in the right place at the right time, and do the follow-up, which is to plant the right trees in the right place at the right time, at least two or three or four every time we cut one down. Um, there are a lot of trees to grow an apartment of 100 square meters. It takes seven seconds in the sustainable forest of Europe takes a plot of land about 40 meters by 40 meters over 50 years. We have wood, we need to use it wisely, and we need to use it forever. Um, by any measure that I know of, timber is the most sustainable building material. It's very building specific, but every time I look at a measurement, timber is better than steel and better than concrete. This is before we take into account that every kilogram of timber sequesters 1.8 kilograms of CO2. Timber and nature does this amazing math because they store this carbon as biomass for us to use and give us back the oxygen for us to breathe. It's something like 75% more efficient than any technology-based carbon capture and storage system that we know of. And so, in this building that you see in the background, we can, if we can account for the 300 cubic meters of timber in that building, it's storing 540 tons of CO2 equivalent. We should put a value on that, and we should put a long-term target for storing that. <coughs> and if we did that in the UK, with the 340,000 houses that England needs every year, we'd be storing 9 million tons of CO2. But can we, do we, how do we do this? Some places do this. Uh, this is um, one of the halls at Cambridge University. It's been storing carbon for 475 years and probably will do for a lot longer. But these long-term asset owners are very rare. They're huge institutions, the monarchy in the UK, the clergy around the world, governments, and places like Cambridge and Oxford that have very, very long histories. How do we encourage that? This is not a technology problem. We have the technology to build any timber building we want. It's a people and policies problem. Um, we need to educate people, and we need to have the right policies to encourage this kind of building. So what are, do we think we should do about that? We work with governments. 
specifically at the moment the UK and Chile to advocate for policies that make this possible, that advocate for long-term storage of CO2, and we work with buildings that are modular kits of parts. This is a project that colleagues and I have done with Ron um, and Anna Ledit, those of you who remember her from last year. It's housing based on the London plan in timber, modular, sustainable, and flexible so that it can adapt over time. With Wa Thistleton Architects, we're using a kit of parts to develop schools. There's the kit, there's a school. You can use the kit in a different way. These institutional approaches, <coughs> and those institutional owners will be the way we unlock the ways to build in the future. So thank you very much. Look forward to discussing. So broad and biobased, interesting what's the potential and can we actually shine a light really on the social impact side as well? Maybe. Thank you for that, Laura, Ron. I mean, sorry, Michael. <laughs> you said Ron earlier. So That's a flattery, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mailing Loco, and I've been uh, spending over a decade working on figuring out how to capture, effectively transform, and effectively time the development of um, materials that are coming out of our agricultural, our food, as well as our building sectors in terms of biomass, a broad stream of biomass. We have about close to 10 billion tons of biomass that is grown, particularly in agriculture, to feed us every year. And we know that about 40% of that is prematurely combusted or down cycle that goes back into agriculture before any part of the plant other than the fruit or maybe a trunk gets to show what it's really made of. That 40% is lost everywhere from the field itself, leaving the farm gate in distribution, somewhere in between uh, our plates and the landfill. About 15% of that is right on the farm, so there's an opportunity to really capture high quality agricultural byproducts right there. And we know that this resource is intimately tied to us as a species. The more we're growing, 8 billion or so, um, the more food we need. And this is inherently driving this production of this material stream, it's renewable. If we do a, a large survey of the world's most largest uh, uh, produced um, agricultural crops, we'll see there is a plethora. And even if you look at one crop, its stalk, its stem, its leaf. Um, there are so many properties that we still haven't necessarily done the research on and found specific applications for it in the built environment, and there are many. You can kind of see, I mean, it's a very uh, data-heavy graph, but you can kind of see uh, these four big circles. Those are the four largest produced agricultural crops on the planet. Um, over 50% of everything that we grow is either sugar, corn, rice, or wheat. And these are our models for biomass that is scaled up. If we were to scale, some of our other lower sort of sibling crops in these models will have tons of problems. Um, this goes into the labor system, it has its roots in slavery. Um, it's incredibly gendered if we think about the gender patterns that we see in agriculture, forestry, and the fact that if we're introducing another lifetime of these materials and buildings, we're gonna exacerbate some of these patterns and obviously the impacts on biological diversity. Um, we chose, and I just want to talk about one because it's the one we began with and I'm still learning about you know, this, this agricultural byproduct today, um, but the coconut husk, which is the byproduct of a multi-billion dollar food and cosmetic industry, um, has a very unique composition, a lot of structural stuff lignin and relatively low sugar stuff cellulose. And it's been used in a whole plethora of building applications from insulation to particle boards, to fiber boards, to roofing sheets. Um, and it was also, we started here mainly because um, really uh, the, there was a sort of a superfood boom around using uh, coconuts in the last two decades. Um, and all along the tropics, we get the production of this large scale, really high bulk density husk material. Um, and we looked at all of the transplantation pathways um, for the byproducts, which is essentially a fiber and a really interesting dust-like substance called the pith. And from that, there's, a, there's sort of a trade-off between really strong materials, which you heat and press, 
that can really uh, sort of fill the gap for reconstituted wood products, fiber boards, OSB part wood boards, um, high-end sort of uh, products like acoustic panels, environmental modules, all the way down to the more lightweight, uh, low-density stuff that is really good at holding moisture, which has huge impact on operational carbon, as well as filtration impacts on indoor air quality. Um, and trying to decide, you know, which transformation pathway became um, sort of the thing that I did right after I graduated and had a startup. And looking back at that larger framework was really important for us because what we were trying to do was shift from what we've been hearing about over and over again, this top-down extraction of value from our land um, through crops. It's transformation which really involves labor that have very little capacity to sequester some of that value or advocate for more value. Farmers, factory workers, from consumers who are completely alienated from who and what went into their building materials and results in huge landfill problems, um, like Norm was describing. So something that we're calling a generative justice economic model, which is different in the fact that it integrates this bottom-up generation of value, looking at the underbelly of this economy. And obviously coconut is one of many material streams, plastics, textiles, all participate in this. But the kind of skills and the roles that we have to develop, particularly as designers, as engineers, policy makers, is to figure out who is going to come to the table to enable this to happen. In this case, the architect starts to look at very different material resources and the challenges in collecting byproduct or waste materials and has to figure out ways to connect with actors that have never been part of this material development cycle. In this case, they were coconut traders that, whose hands the husk was in, in the hands of, you know, in urban cities where they're sold. And how to return that value back to such labor systems, labor systems right at the farm itself, and most particularly <coughs> back to the land. How do you return these materials safely and in a timely pace um, back to the land and environment itself? So I just maybe want to go through the most important part of the work that we're doing, which is the value framework. And it's really about thinking about the market opportunities right off the bat. Um, Often we see the fact that a lot of these agricultural byproducts go back into agriculture, as I mentioned, as fertilizers, soil erosion control technologies, um, soil substitute media, when they have much more value to, to, to offer. So if you think about everything, something like a coconut husk has to do throughout its life as an as a enclosure for a fruit, it's dealing with sun, salt, wind, high humidity, all of that performance can show up in the next life of the material. And so this idea of doing panels, reconstituted sort of medium density of fiber boards was, was key. That multiplies the value for every unit mass of that, that byproduct. Furthermore, if you embed intelligence around the form, you can go to acoustic panels or environmental uh, modules that help generate that value. Often the value of death is a lot of biocomposite companies can't break into those markets, and so go back to insulation stuff we don't see, stuff that has very short lifetimes packaging, um, and are never quite able to make that transition to actually become a, a, a holistic part of the building envelope. Uh, the second is really that value translation piece, which to me addresses the labor <coughs> opportunity here, um, which has to do with the fact that there is a new generation of green collar workers um, whose jobs haven't even been created. Um, and I think this is really exciting to see people, for example, coconut traders are essentially criminals in some countries because they're burning um, a byproduct that is not allowed into the waste municipal system. Um, instead, if they were actually used as vital stakeholders to transform those husks right at where they're produced and sell that as a high quality raw material for biocomposite companies, they become an ally. Gender equity is huge, obviously, um, and looking at women leadership, particularly moving across the agricultural and building sector, and the distributed nature of this means that a lot of people can participate, including consumers, traditional consumers, urban farmers, um, and the like. And all towards trying to figure out how to circulate that value in a much more equitable way. Um, for us, this is a real opportunity to think not only about one crop and scaling that up, there's no one solution, but rather, if you look at a bioregion where you have different crops grown in the same climate, grown in the same soil, you have the opportunity to have seasonal uh, feedstock in development of building materials. 
Um, the aspect of bringing in new uh, people who haven't necessarily been part of this value chain means it's incredibly participatory. And lastly, novel ownership models, and I'll talk about this maybe later in the Q&A, but really thinking about the infrastructure, the distributed infrastructure that's required to collect a material resource that is distributed and its waste is at the moment low quality, means that we have new infrastructure to develop um, and um, new forms also of owning and maintaining these materials and buildings. So thank you and look forward to the discussion. We're talking deep equity in these value chains. You teed up nicely, actually. How do we really throw this year? Right, uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks, James. Um, well, first of all, it's just mind blowing. I just love learning about these things. Um, so, regeneration uh, is a strategy that we launched uh, in uh, mid December last year. Uh, it's um, what is the first strategy in the market that uses regenerative principles? Uh, even though you are here, there are biodiversity funds that's been launched by our competitors, but uh, for us, it's not about biodiversity per se, but it's really about <coughs> leveraging the regenerative principles to tackle the biodiversity loss, which is a planetary urgency. So uh, let's start. Let's start. Okay, let's start. I'm sure. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. So I, I, I just imagined to repeat myself. Um, <laughs> um, Everyone is probably quite familiar with this picture. More than 50% of our GDP is moderately or highly dependent on ecosystem services. Um, we are already at the point where we've lost 69% of our wildlife vertebrate uh, uh, population. Meanwhile, 7.2% of our economy is recycled or reused. So yeah, uh, it's actually dropped last year. Last year was 8.6%. Uh, um, with, with that with that in mind, right, so we, we, we know that uh, the planetary boundary, so uh, we, we're all quite familiar with the planetary boundary model in this room, I believe. And uh, so uh, so what we look at is looking at a specific um, uh, 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 boundary, which biodiversity loss, as you can see, is the most breached boundary. And, and, and because of the, uh, the interlinkage between the boundaries, so biodiversity loss is very much tied to land use, climate change, water, etc. We thought it was a good idea to focus specifically on biodiversity loss, building on our experience operationalizing the planetary boundaries model for the past 10 years. So we were the first, uh, we were, we were the first firm to operationalize the planetary boundary uh, framework, basically incorporating that in the construction of investment units. So we have a way to measure uh, the life cycle impact uh, of the products and services of the companies. Uh, and then try to understand the impact on the various uh, planetary boundaries based on the latest scientific literature. Uh, from there on, then we incorporate a sort of do donor economics model, and uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar as well. So incorporating and integrating the social foundation. So really seeing these as you know uh, going uh, going hand in hand. So uh, when we integrate uh, the social foundation, you know that the, the point is to to uh, drive us to start thinking about transitioning towards the regenerative economy. Now, this is a picture that you've seen it a few times already. Uh, I have uh, shamelessly poached it from Bill. But uh, this is, um, when you think about where we are today, we're at, we are a degenerative economy. So this is, a, so we are looking at this from an economy perspective, not just a design perspective. So so yes, you know, we're, we're trying to head to net zero and you know, as you can, as, as you know, net zero is, is a false thing, right, because um, net zero means 69% biodiversity loss, even if we, we fix everything tomorrow. So we have to move beyond that. So that means restorative and regenerative economy. So how do we, how do we go there? How do we get there? Most of the companies, even the best ones, right? So uh, most sustainable brands out there, Patagonia will, will tell you, the CEO will tell you that they're around here. They're getting close, <coughs> they're not crossing. Uh, to, to get to that restorative state and regenerative state, which incorporate the social foundation, uh, it, it takes a lot more work. So how do we identify companies that are aligned with the regenerative principles to move our society, our economy, towards that regenerative state? Um, so the way we think about it is uh, three principles. Uh, some of you must be quite familiar with these. Uh, so narrow, slow, and loop, right? So inspired by actually a uh, cradle to cradle approach. So when we think about a circular economy, uh, we need to enable the circular economy. So there are companies out there that are very much, their revenues are very much tied or aligned uh, in a large extent to, to uh, these three principles. And then there are companies that are 
actively doing the renew, uh, renewal and allowing renewal of uh, natural resources. So this is about relieving the ecological pressure on our ecological limit, the planetary boundaries. And then uh, it's empower. Empower is about satisfying basic social needs and raising environmental awareness. So there are companies that are specifically helping us to build a more resilient society and, and more, more important than that, a regenerative society. So how do we think about our opportunity set? Based on those five principles, narrow, slow, loop, uh, renew, and empower, right? Um, so narrow, slow, loop forms a mega theme that we think, uh, so circular economy. Renew is uh, related to biological, um, so biodiversity restoration, and then empower is about social empowerment. So we think all three has to go hand in hand. So when we think about um, uh, uh, narrow, it's about efficiency improvement, it's about ecological design, which is very tied to actually what many of you do here. Uh, and, and we think about slower consumption, so uh, you can think about you know, second-hand platforms um, uh, for car parts and hopefully in the future building materials. Um, and then um, material repurposing, this is quite tied to how do we you know, recycle things and how do we recycle without downcycling. Right, uh, upcycle uh, our materials. And then in terms of renew, um, everyone is familiar with renewable energy, but the biological resources, we see a lot of opportunities there as well. So especially with you know, uh, renewable materials, a lot of you are working on them actively, hopefully, you will all one day be in the public market. And uh, regenerative agriculture, very important, right? So the agricultural space has so much that we can work on. Uh, and, and, you know, the, and, and a good thing is, uh, and, and you should know that, is that um, the, the top <coughs> asset managers are looking at it. Uh, their ESG teams are very much uh, considering regenerative agriculture, and, um, and, and this is an area of focus and hopefully grow. And lastly, um, uh, economic inclusion. So we think about this not as, um, uh, you, know, um, you know, healthcare specific as healthcare, but we're thinking about access, right? We're thinking about relationship. So we're thinking about access to finance, access to business opportunity, access to education, and access to healthcare. It's getting our folks there, right? So not just the opportunity itself, it's the access to opportunity. Uh, I have some um, examples in the Suico, and uh, some of you are familiar, if you're in the building material space, and uh, Autodesk, if you're in the uh, design space, so these are very much aligned with uh, what we do, and they, there's a long way to go for them as well. So that's that's not that's not uh, get us uh, get ahead of time. And you know these guys um, have uh, are moving towards uh, you know sustainable materials. Uh, their design uh, softwares are also thinking about incorporating biodiversity impact as well as uh, you know um, impact on the environment, and they're thinking about it in a more systems approach these days as well. Autodesk is a good example because they. Now they're thinking about whenever you're building, a, uh, you're, you're, you're uh, casting a building in the software, they're not just looking at one building, they're looking at the relationship between multiple buildings and they have ways to access the, uh, assess the uh, bio uh, biodiversity impact uh, and the environmental impact, water use, etc., cetera, of, um, of, the, of the buildings. So that's, uh, I, I will end here, and, and I'm happy to talk about how we do this, right? how we uh, measure biodiversity impact, how we measure environmental impact on the ninth century. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Just <laughs> timing and quarter past is when we take you to lunch. But I, I was going to spark a bit of debate between you, but I want to throw it straight out to the room, actually. You've all been talking to people over this last couple of days about how you push this regenerative resource revolution forward. So I'm interested, I'd love to hear the flavour of some of those conversations around the what now when we leave the room. What the, uh, about some of these things, what can we do? Frankly, what more can we do together when we leave this room? I, I encourage, when we ask the audience for the same back, to stick with this theme, right? How do we snowball into action? So I don't know who wants to jump in further than that, but I'd be keen to get the flavor of your discussions around how, how we move some of these different pieces with this. Um, I think we, uh, we, we all talked about uh, like, like we need to really co collaborate. So actually, I think it's so important not to uh, stay on, okay, everyone is doing their own, but actually to figure out how to bring these things together. Because there are so many great projects here, and uh, for example, I would be really happy to show more of these projects in, for example, at our Congress, we're, we're doing the Cradle to Cradle Congress every year with 1,000 participants to bring the community together. And I think it's so important to like not, uh, have the 
our egos too big, that everyone needs to be the one who is doing it, but actually to bring it together. And I think there are so many people in here who really got that we are not uh, there when we only are doing less bad. And I think this is so great. I mean, meeting so many people who really got this, not only changing our uh, behavior uh, uh, in a bit, but actually radically changing something. And to get this together, it's, yeah, I think that's one of the most important things. And your promo in Scott's workshop later <laughs> on how can we collaborate, rather than talk about it, really, how do we do systemic <coughs> collaboration as, as part of the course? Group? Yeah, thank you, James, and thank you, everyone up here. Well, um, I'm a professor, so you're probably not going to be surprised to hear that I think education is the key. Um, but it's not the type of education that I do every day at Cambridge University. It's education amongst ourselves. It's you heard Indy speak about it this morning. We need a systemic change in the way that we do and think about education. And as I said, it's, it's people and policies that are the problem. It's not fundamental technology or fundamental information. Um, so since I'm a teacher, I'm going to give you homework. Um, and that homework is to tell at least three people about what you've learned here. And I don't mean your family. I mean someone who you think might be able to take that knowledge and take it forward and do something else with it. Great. And others working in, on education in the room? Just quick hands up. Yeah, okay. Who's? We'll, we'll pull you in in a second. <laughs> we don't have to uh, just go in the line. That's you're supposed to be disruptive. Sure. So, uh, <laughs> the, the way I think about it is two two folks. Uh, one one is um, uh, rapid task force, right? So you know, if you, you think about the, the the trajectory of a startup, you know, we have many startup founders here. From from where you are in the financing gap, philanthropic um, foundations to the VC to PE and it us, right? So we support IPOs company that I so and we just done one uh, recently. So for us, we would love to have, imagine you just have philanthropic, just four people in one room, plus the founder, maybe maybe three more founders, whatever, and just figure out, is that is that the plan that we can, we can make? What can we do to help you accelerate? Because there is a speed that's needed, and it's, the speed to market is not just about you know, return, it's actually about the urgency of solving these issues. So I think the rapid task force is really helpful because um, then we, we don't have to bog down by you know, nicety and, and too many people and all that sort of thing. They just focus on getting it done. Um, so that's one. Two is, um, I, I really like this concept, and it's not in our universe, and I wish we were happy one day, which is regenerative media. Um, right now, um, most of our, the way we are educated is you know, extremely linear, it's extremely static, and, um, and media, as, as you can and we have the trust in media, if you do and look at any polls or survey, that's gone down significantly. So if we have the ability to invest in companies that are actively helping to promote a stronger society and better, <coughs> more integrated ecosystem, that, that would be a dream, right? So that's, uh, and an educational company, we actually do invest in an educational company, and we try to get them to uh, uh, incorporate more sustainable education. And this is one of my other hats as an engagement specialist. So, so I talk to companies on a weekly basis, their C-suites and their CSOs, and the main point is to try to get them to adopt green solutions if we can, and focusing on the positives, not just the negatives. The negatives companies hear that all the time, but that's not going to help them actually drive growth and drive the, the actual growth the right way. So we think we have seen companies actively trying to address this, but I don't know if they necessarily know the folks, for example, the, the, the entrepreneurs in this room and the technologies in this room, and the really cool things that you know um, our panels are. Managers are working on. So I, will, I, I think that that gap is a big bridge. I hear there's a lunchtime task force starting <laughs> against you. If you're up for that, maybe uh -huh. get the final word before I throw it out. <laughs> again, action oriented publications and questions. Yeah, uh, I think there are two. One is finance, and um, I think almost every biomaterial company I know tends to pick one and scale very quickly um, to prove that they can survive and their material has a market demand. and. Every time I, I look at any of the materials we work on, it becomes very clear that no one biomass material can do everything on its own. There's supply chain issues, there's performance issues, there's seasonal issues, and those are huge risks. And depending on your source, I mean, not all these materials are created equal. 
uh, a timber, a tree source in the Amazon, very different value to the world versus the land grown on plantation, you know, here in Switzerland, for example. Um, so how do we begin to value some of these, um, you know, agricultural and forestry assets in a way that reflects that? And how do you also figure out a bioregional approach to actually scan, scaling this biomass? And so how do we finance that in a much larger, more effective way that allows these materials to scale? And it's a big question, but I think a few people have probed that over the last few days. And second is cultural, because I think um, getting people to adopt these materials are quite easy in places like Europe and, and North America. In developing contacts, actually, they're your toughest customers. Everyone wants to build with modern materials, glass, concrete, uh, concrete steel. And that cultural um, thing is complex. It's also linked to comfort, um, getting very specific air um, quality and air conditions very quickly. And, and we're talking about quite passive material systems. Um, and so it's wrapped up in all of this social, cultural, um, very tough barriers. I agree with Michael completely. I don't think the technical aspects are the problem. It's how do you get designers, architects, as allies to influence consumer behavior when, when bringing this into buildings or getting consumers to actually desire and ask for these. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's something I, I, I'm not sure I've heard the answer or inklings to that, but um, yeah, it's a... Uh, Mike and the narrative team, there's a challenge for you. So as we come out, yeah, I, I think so. You, you put it very nicely. Concise questions, but I'd also invite provocations to action. We've been having a lot of these discussions, so we'll really invite concise questions and provocations to action. It, it may be an obvious uh, point, but I'll, I'll make it anyway. Just, just, just I wonder whether or not, having listened to and spoken to lots of people in this room over the last couple of days, there are people who are pro-mass timber, people who are pro-lightweight soil timber, people who are pro you know, different biomaterials and so on. And um, it's easy to get kind of bamboozled by all those different choices and options, right? And, uh, and for a long time, I've, I've advocated talking to policymakers and clients about don't specify the solution, specify the outcome that you want. And I just wonder if we as a community need to be better at arriving at a set of outcomes that we want our customers to specify. And then there'll be lots of different choices and some will be more appropriate in some locations than others. So do we need to get better at speaking one common language? Is it helpful, provocatively, to carry on talking about cradle, cradle, and circular economy? Do we need to get behind one term? Do we need to get behind regenerative? Do we need to get behind lower embodied carbon? What, what, are, what are the things we want to hang our agenda on and say, these are the things you need to specify, and then we've got a whole range of solutions to help you get there? Quick response. I'm, I'm going to jump right in, uh, because I think you're absolutely right. We, I mean, I'm, I'm a timber advocate. You said bamboozled. I'm taking a bamboo from that. Um, but nobody wants to be bamboozled into a solution. And therefore, for policies for building materials should be driving down towards lowest carbon. And if someone can get there with a low carbon cement or low carbon steel, more power to that person, those companies, because that's what, that's what we care about. We don't actually care about cutting down more trees. We care about cutting down fewer if we can. Um, and that will drive innovation. If we just say you have to use timber buildings or timber in buildings, that won't. So um, it's the target number we should get at rather than the specific material. And maybe I'd like to add to this. Uh, I think like we can see that in, this, in the discussion right now, uh, we are still talking about reducing carbon. And to see that we should clarify, it's not about reducing carbon, but it's actually having carbon in a circular way. So using carbon and not reducing carbon. And so it matters, it matters what, we, what our goals are. And I think it's really important to bring these goals uh, together, and it's not that we all have the, the same goals right now in the discussion. And so that's why we are, I think, struggling with all these different words, because that slightly we mean something different. Um, so to figure out this, this uh, common narrative, I think this is still the point where we are at, and that's why it's so difficult. Question over here? Yeah, it's over here. Yeah, um, thank you, really fascinating. The question I'd like to ask is, for 90% for of human civilization, we've built on Earth. Um, the people on Earth right now, in this time, 
who live within the parents of the earth, the builder of earth. Um, the epidemic's only fried. Well, it, it, it's to quote him, he would say that technology merely destroys the world faster. Um, the question that's sitting in my mind is should, um, should we be looking in all these places, all these technological places? And how, how do you, what do you say to the question of should we? <laughs> if that <laughs> for, me, for, for me, technology doesn't have to be the ones that you think we're in a lab called going to lab. Just, there's a lot of technology itself. This building itself is it's made out of ancient technologies. That there is, so it's, it's not necessarily correlated in that sense. Um, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I completely agree with that comment, but I also think, you know, our population is growing and we have an extreme pressure to house them. The should is there. Um, the, the way we do it matters a lot, which I think your question gets to the heart of. And I think the transformation pathways, if we were to evaluate how much energy and what is the desired outcome we need from those materials, I think our, our, our types of, of processes would completely change. One may not have to shred a husk, press it, heat it to make a fiber board. It might be able to in, be infill, you know, in, in a sort of really interesting structural cavity. But yeah. I think the transformation pathway, the process itself, really matters. Question over here, and then we've got two over here. Just a question, because Michael, you mentioned the policy and people being the, the, the main barrier now, and I completely agree. But one of the things that I've experienced from a technical perspective is that what's been driving that uh, positive change is that we've had a common language in terms of innovation, so we have the TRL technology readiness level that we use across the European Union, that, that's effective in driving change. So when we look towards policy, behavioral change, culture shifts, do you know of any sort of models that we could create, create a, a framework around a common language? Or if not, what would you put into that model? What would we need to be mindful of similar to that technology readiness level framework that we have? I mean, just a quick thing, I mean, maybe it's also about thinking how we redefine technological readiness level, which is all about technical performance, but we're not <coughs> taking into account the social, the environmental, the economic impacts. Um, but yeah, the TRL for me has been quite uh, limiting, and so maybe redefining it because it's such a well understood way of saying, I'm going to invest in that, I'm going to actually provide a grant to take that further is, is key, but I don't, I don't have a great answer of an existing framework that, that might do that. If I may just give a shout out to the credit to cradle uh, approach, because I, I really would encourage you folks to focus on thoughtful design. It may not, you may not need the common language, but thoughtful design, team thoughtful design will make a difference. Because if you're designing, you know, something, uh, 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 that's why we think about, we use life cycle analysis when we are we're analyzing products and services of our companies. Because a company that is, Making a, a product, even if you, you really help with climate change, it's going to have some sort of byproduct uh, uh, impact. And I just want to quote the Macrado and Macrado book itself that you know that the fact that the, the biomass of ants all over the world is actually bigger than humans, and yet you don't see them having all the problems that we're experiencing. <laughs> <laughs> even even their biochemical weapons is biodegradable. So. <laughs> That's <laughs> uh, I want to build a comment a little bit on what, uh, what Michael said. Uh, and it feels like, you know, for once being the, the, the sort of uh, legislature is a little bit uh, ahead of this, this discussion. There is a new Danish requirement for all new buildings uh, that must document the environmental impact over the lifespan of 50 years through an LCA calculation. Uh, and if you build above 30, sorry, 1,000 square meters, apparently you must comply with a limit value of 12 kilograms per CO2 equivalent per square meter. So that feels like you know, it's setting a constraint, and with that, that constraint, you can then be as creative as you want and make as many material choices as you want, as long as you hit that target. And that feels like a very simple approach that is also not very constrained in the sense of the creativity and design choices you can deploy. And I sort of wonder whether you can probably comment, is this sort of the way forward? Or what is the sort of problem with that approach? It feels intuitively as a non-practitioner, very simple and very straightforward. I think it's a great, a, a great way forward. And London has some targets like that. 
the emissions per square meter. Um, and then what we need, so as a, as a way to go forward, I think it's really positive, what we need to make sure is that the calculation of what that is, is uh, both robust and transparent. And that your calculation is the same as the test calculation and that somebody over there isn't cheating because their calculation <coughs> is fuzzy. It's not Enron. <laughs> very last question. Sorry, just a oh, very quick add on to that. Um, the average building today is basically about 600 kilograms of CO2 per square meter. And with bio-based building materials, it ranges from 20, well below that 600, to 1,200. Which means there are terrible ways to use bio-based materials. Engineered bamboo has the body carbon footprint of steel because of all of the adhesives. So I love the idea of that constraint because within that, you might figure out the right processing methods. Things are just out of, off the table simply because of that carbon you know, footprint. Two rapid fire questions to bring us to a close. Um, yeah, like I really like this discussion because it actually really targets like one core question that I put in the chat in the beginning of this conference. Because uh, like like with timber, I mean I, I, I have a startup which processes a lot of timber, uh, um, but we still talk uh, of uh, decreasing carbon, and the, the the core message of this is like more as if um, is that we are still like. As we, as, as, like on an on a institutional cultural level, if we're just talking about decreasing, it still means, okay, a human is bad, and the only way a human can be better is by being less bad. And this is like, a, when you think it to the end, it's like a really bad message, or like a very <laughs> bad perception of what, of, of, what, of what humans can do. So on a cultural level, I, should, I think we should be aware that talking about just if we just uh, stay uh, talking about decreasing carbon dioxide emissions, it, it means basically, okay, we humans, we can't be good. Every newborn should be born. And, and, but on, a, on another institutional level, like the policy level, I think it's a very effective measure on how to um, innovate and, and to transform um, the, uh, the, the economy towards more sustainability. So we have like a map of Europe, uh, like the, the, the regulatory race towards more sustainability, uh, with carbon caps, the square meter, you have by material quotas. So it's not a, it's not a real question, but I, I want to just yeah. I also I also saw all those theories, and they have like slight differences. You you've gathered uh, all a bunch of those theories, and and I just want to raise awareness about those different institutional levels. Like, so on a cultural level, we should move towards a positive narrative and let's take it forward in that narrative's work very few final words go ahead and have your hand up maybe it's a call to action well we're happily <laughs> joining a call to action but i actually had a question so let me turn into a call of action on tuesday the european parliament turned down the nature restoration law um, and at the core of that is a huge debate fierce unpleasant dirty tactics on misinformation I'm interested in the political dimension of this and the way in which we bring a collective intelligence to the question of extremely difficult multi-perspectival decision making that is right at the heart of tensions on interests from farmers, farming communities, forestry industry, and at the same time the <coughs> false opposition between protecting nature and protecting the economy. How might we and I know it's a hard, nasty question just before lunch, but how might we act as a community to address into that space of policy, politics, information, and, and taking multiple perspectives to help us get to something Can I say more effective? Lunch working group. And can that, that be our call to Yeah, action? yeah, absolutely. I, very keen, I mean, first of all, to say a huge thank you to our disruptors on the panel. <laughs> of time, not just the close of our time coming together in clusters, but of actually really taking on these lunchtime discussions to move forward action. So without further ado, do join some of this. James, thank you. Uh, thank you to the panel once again. Thank you.